Without further ado, welcome to External Antenna Visualizations Part 2 with my uh, with our esteemed guest, and I am your sidekick, Stu, and we're welcoming Dennis Burrell back to the stage. So, Tawny, this is a really exciting day because we're bringing Dennis back to the stage here, yes. and we had such a great um, review of our last webinar um, yeah. back in July, and it was uh, rave reviews, and now we're going to go even deeper on antennas. Yes. Right. Yes, we are. Uh, by the way, I love how you launched into like radio voice as soon as you said we're going to get started. It was like <laughs> welcome. So good, you know. W- way to go, Stu. I I, I love that. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, there. <laughs> uh, folks, yes, we're excited to have Dennis back. For those of you who did not get to hear the first one, make sure you go back and listen. Dennis is a phenomenal individual. Um, and for those of you who don't know him, Dennis, I will allow you to introduce yourself. I will allow you, Dennis. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> Please. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dennis Burrell. I am a senior product uh, manager at uh, Ventive Wireless Infrastructure. I've been with the company for 11 years, and I'm happy to be back to talk antennas. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny, Stu and I, one of the things that we look at during the, uh, during the webinars, we get a lot of folks who have a lot of questions about what antenna would you recommend for this? What antenna would you recommend for, for this type of deployment or this type of deployment? And so folks, we're going to be able to get Dennis to answer some of those questions for us today. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about the importance of antennas in your design. So Dennis, talk to us. Why are they so essential? I mean, theoretically, we all know, but give us a little insight. So um, I like to um, look at the antenna as the uh, last transformer uh, before free space. And as you can see with that little diagram to the right, Mm -hmm. it just shows uh, transmit and receive um, where the antenna plays the integral part of transmitting and then receiving the signal. So on the transmit side, it takes electrical signal and turns it into an electromagnetic signal and then um, vice versa on the receive side. Mm-hmm. So um, we know that uh, antennas transmit and receive and here are some of the reasons why um, they're so important in your design is uh, they keep RF where you want it so you can concentrate RF in the desired direction. Um, and that's um, specifically for the most part with um Uh, directional antennas, and then they Mm -hmm. can block RF where you don't want it because uh, antennas are frequency dependent. So we'll discuss that a little more. So Uh um, depending on your frequency of operation, um, that's the band that you're going to operate in. And then um, depending on the fall off or the roll off of the antenna, um, the beam width, um, you can block RF um, from that perspective as well. And then we have reciprocity. So that's the increased ability for client devices and APs to hear each other. Um, you know, we had some questions uh, in the, previously about uh, reciprocity, uh, meaning mm-hmm. if you have a high gain antenna and a client device with a uh, low gain antenna, um, the antenna from the say AP or the radio can get to the client device, but the client device can't get back. Um, that's not um, true in the case of antennas because of reciprocity. So Mm -hmm. whatever goes out from the antenna, you'll be able to hear it back from the antenna because the antenna still still exhibits the same same pattern coming and going, meaning transmit and receiving. So it will be able to receive that signal back from the client device. Mm -hmm. Um, You can uh, increase density and aggregate throughput and then you can reduce uh, co-channel interference by shaping the RF. And that's with um, narrow beam with antennas with a mm-hmm. good front to back ratio. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the one of the most um, interesting ones to me is because you really can, utilizing the antennas, determine where you, buy, where you place it, what it's going to look like, right? So you really do be able to create the shape of what your RF, of what that pattern is going to look like. That is correct. Yeah. Um, so let's look at specifically how, or Stu, before I jump in, Stu, yeah. what are your thoughts? You know what? I, I you know what really st- stood out on this is the actual reducing the co channel interference by shaping the RF. And I think that that's something that is, you know, sometimes lost is that um, when we're, you know, when antennas are being designed, they're designed to focus 
right? They're designed to mm-hmm. make sure that we we can use them in those environments. I that just kind of really stood out to me is is mm-hmm. you know why do you need them? And you're you're always looking at is don't just assume that an omnidirectional is going to work everywhere, right? Right. Look at your environment and understand like be the be the client. Well, you are, but be the device and understand is <laughs> put your ears on and go, can I hear that AP? I can see, well, no, I think it's going to deflect off of the something or it's going to reflect or some uh, off of the environment. So get a handle. Is it a long corridor? Is mm-hmm. it that long super corridor at LAX when you arrive, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, the one I'm talking about, <laughs> that super long corridor in terminals. <laughs> I think it's in one or three. Anyways, is, is, is they got antennas pointed down that corridor and you think of it as well, that's why they're pointed at you and pointed back so that you can, your device mm-hmm. can hear them. So antennas are important. Right. And then Absolutely. so also, also from that perspective, the height that you're mounting them, for instance, you mentioned mm-hmm. the omnis, don't assume omnis can be used everywhere. There's a, there's a point where you get to a height of that antenna because we know that an omni has that shape where it has nose at the top and the bottom. And the higher you put that antenna up, the, 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 the more that dead space underneath the antenna is. So we always kind of set a threshold of, if you're going to use an omni, use it at this height, at a certain height, around 20, 20 feet or below. Anything mm-hmm. above that, let's change to a directional because you're going to get that null zone underneath of that omni antenna. And that's very important mm-hmm. uh, uh, point is that most folks know that the omni directionals are designed for certain heights. Like uh, on your standard AP without antennas, it there's just, mm-hmm. it was designed for that sweet spot, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And Joe um, had a really good point, specifically talking about reciprocity. You can't control what antennas are being utilized in the end devices, into the laptops, into the phones, into all of the other handheld scanners. You don't know necessarily or have any control over that, but you can have control over this to help increase that. So I think. Uh, really, really good points to understand. But let's specifically let's jump into how RF behaves. And let's look at that. Right. So, so we, we kind of briefly went over this. The behavior of the antenna is dependent mm-hmm. on the type of antenna in your design. Mm-hmm. You know, your omnidirectional 360 degree coverage um, versus directional coverage pattern. And here we have we have a couple of uh, uh, directionals and omnidirectional antennas just showing, right? So, um, Let's talk with high gains. So for high gains, typically your beam widths are vary between five degrees to sixty degrees, and that's on in your vertical and your horizontal pattern. Whereas for a high gain omni, you still have that omni pattern, but you have that narrow vertical beam width, right? Mm-hmm. So that narrow vertical beam width um, only gives you a certain amount of coverage. And then just going back to that height, the higher a higher gain antenna is, the more um, the more that null area is because you only have a narrow beam width to begin with, right? So um, you have to be careful when you're dealing with um, high directional or highly high gain omnidirectional antennas. And then on uh, on um, um, low gain, more of a low gain, low gain omnis give you more of that wider pattern, that larger coverage area. But just be careful with that height. Um, and I just saw a question um, just popped up uh, about the height. Uh, yeah, we usually recommend around 20 feet. After 20 feet, we start looking at directional antennas. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with your low gain um, antennas, that beam width can vary. Um, that, that beam width varies as well. So we're talking about from 60 up to uh, 180. Um, I know they've You've heard about antennas that have a 180 degree beam width. That's kind of really hard to get to those fringes. And so although we say 180, I would say somewhere probably a max around 170 degrees um, for that beam width. And we're going to look at some examples that have quite a large beam width here a uh, little on or later on in a little on the webinar. Um, but, you know, Dennis, one of the questions. So, and, and folks, anyone else have any better suggestion, but when you're looking at when the AP and when the client can't hear the AP anymore, keep walking down the aisle. Can I hear it at two feet? Can I hear it at four feet? Is my client still responding at six feet and just keep going down any, uh, Stu, any other thoughts on that? And so you mark the points where it can't hear it anymore. And so that's how you're doing the testing. You, you take your device, you have your AP and you walk it out and you say, okay, two feet. Yes, I can hear Mm. four feet. Yes, I can hear six feet. Yes. Okay. Eight feet. I'm having a little issue. 
10 feet is my, you know, and so you kind of measure and make some adjustments that way so that you know where you're going to be able to hear um, where that, that line is for the, for the client. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you want to understand, and there was that question that's hiding the Q and a there is, you mm -hmm. know, when you do that long quarter, how do you know? Right. And well, mm -hmm. you use tools, right. To get the, to get that information, um, you know, uh, product plugin, right. The, the guy right beside me here, my little sidekick, <laughs> right. Can tell me just that it can tell me the performance of the antenna. Now I can read the spec sheets on the antenna. That's, that's good. But what does it look like in real life? How do we visualize that? Right. And we can actually go out with, um, a device like this and well, the device, uh, we can actually go out with our device and actually go and measure that and then apply uh, mobile mobile views or offsets mm -hmm. for the device to get the actual piece because many of our devices may not tell us exactly what um, they're seeing from an RSSI level or power level. They may not, right? So mm -hmm. this is where we have tools to help us understand those visualizations in our planning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but before we, before we move on, I have a question for you guys. Have you ah. ever designed a network using external antennas? So let's uh, see the responses in here. Thank you, Stu, for, for my Excellent. Jeopardy music. Yes. All right. As the, the responses roll in. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, external antennas, man, they're fascinating. Some of the things that you can do. Yeah. So let's see how fast folks can actually uh, vote on this one. <laughs> Um, it's not showing the voting for me today. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it All right. Well, system. let's look at that. So, so quite a, a, a interesting, uh, as a lot of folks haven't um, yeah. been able to use those. So, um, so maybe uh, after today, that's something that we, we can look at and get some recommendations. All right. Uh, but specifically, all right. So now we're going to get into some of the fun stuff that Dennis gets to do about antenna design and creating the specifications for antenna in design. So Dennis, share with us, talk to us about the secret sauce, so to speak. Right, so <laughs> <laughs> the secret sauce, yeah, exactly, right? So that's that's that RF is always something secret or something magical about the RF. And basically it's, it's not that it's magical, it's just, you know, a lot of, a lot of equations used to solve mm -hmm. specific formulas to come up with the different, um, the different different parameters uh, that you need in designing an antenna, right? So um, <clears throat> antenna designs are centered around specifications that you use to de determine the performance characteristics of, of that antenna, or you know how the antenna wants to uh, operate, or you get specifications, or you're talking to your customers. One of the things we rely on is uh, customer feedback. And one of the things that I could say about this industry is that we always get great customer feedback of what they would like to see in an antenna or what they would like an antenna to do, because they always have different scenarios, whether it be a stadium, whether it be a long corridor, whether it be in a freezer box or something like that, and how how can they get an antenna to perform in those uh, different scenarios, right? So. Mm -hmm. When you think of antennas, um, the first thing you think of is gain and beam width, right? Those are the specifications that come to mind. On the last webinar we did, we talked about also, we talked about uh, front to back ratio and we talked about side lobes, but um, we mm -hmm. wanted to I wanted to look at some other different things. So um, the main thing that I wanted to look at is how, what's the resonant frequency of an antenna? How do you get that antenna to resonate at the frequency of operation that you want? You know, in our mm -hmm. case, 2.4 and 5. And then with Wi-Fi 6E, 6 to 7.125 gigahertz, right? So mm -hmm. how do we go about uh, defining that resonance? And then once we have that resonance, what's the bandwidth of the antenna. So not beam mm -hmm. width, but the bandwidth of the antenna. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I have down here, are just some different uh, parameters that you want to look at uh, with the resonant frequency. So we know that the, the antenna has a capacitance and an inductance associated with it, right? And then that sweet spot of where you minimize the uh, impedance and capacitance uh, is that resonant frequency. Mm -hmm. And that resonant frequency, also called like the center frequency, is the center frequency of operation of the antenna, right? So, for instance, if I'm going to design uh, the antenna at 2.4 to cover the 2.4 band, we know that that antenna needs to cover uh, from 2.4 to 2.5. So, I'm going to design the antenna to be resonant at 2.45, right in the center, right? And mm -hmm. then, then, um, 
the, the sides or the roll off to the sides that come that that's the you want that at a certain level so it is still operate so that it operates functionally at 2.4 and 5. So once you get the resonant frequency, then you can take that and then you look at the reflection coefficient. Mm -hmm. Now the middle, that middle picture is your reflection coefficient. So the reflection coefficient, pretty much what that does is that kind of gives you an idea of how much of the antenna power is trans, how much of the power from a radio going through an antenna actually gets out the antenna and what's reflected back into the radio, right? Mm -hmm. So th this, is, this is important because you don't want a lot of your power being reflected back into your radio, especially on the transmit side because it can right. damage the radio. So the reflection coefficient, for instance, at this minus, uh, minus 10 level, mm -hmm. um, going through uh, equations that gives you probably about around 90% of your 90% um, of your power is going out of the antenna and around 10% is being reflected back into the radio. From that reflection coefficient, you can uh, you can figure out what the return loss is. The return loss is basically uh, the absolute value of the reflection coefficient, but um, for equation sakes, I have it down there to the right, uh, minus 20 log of the reflection coefficient. Mm -hmm. And then VISWAR, your voltage standing wave ratio. So on our spec sheets, you'll always see a VISWAR um, rating. That's that standing wave ratio, and that translates it back to uh, power transmitted to power reflected. And typically, we set our uh, standing wave ratio to be two to one. And based on that two to one, um, we're talking about about 90% of the uh, power being transmitted from the antenna and around the other 10% being reflected. Now, when you draw a line across that, say that 2.0, you see it crosses mm -hmm. that, it, it crosses, it crosses that null, say, or the resonance at two points. And where it crosses that those two points, that's your, um, those are your frequencies that you can operate under that Visoire 2.1 or two, two to one. Mm -hmm. and, and I know it's a, it, this is a lot of the, the technical stuff right here, but. Oh, that's um, good. Uh, I, I'm actually just kind of mind blown here because you've you've literally gone in and and talked like a whole bunch of cool like you know <laughs> we need to have a session at a on a next we need to have a like there there could be so many things we can ask I mean I mean I love the term um, uh, visoir I was actually you know my, my you know being a, a, a I love Star Trek I was being I was confused with a, one of the species from the Delta Quadrant the Vardwar but it was the visoir that's a great acronym. Um, and I like that. And, and, and these little things I like, you know, want to learn more, right? Sorry, Dennis, you've actually kind of like sparked me. I get excited about kind of like, you know, understanding the nuances and understanding the, like the, right. the, little, the cool geekness, right? Of mm -hmm. like the uber geekness yeah. of what you do, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I think overload, right? Yeah. But the, but the good thing about this is that, you know, there are, um, there are, uh, you know, you can go to the internet and there are calculators that calculate this stuff, right? So mm -hmm. um, you can say, you, what what frequency you operate in that, you know, and what kind of reflections that you want. And you can plug it in and you can say, oh, at a reflection coefficient of 10, I get a visoire of so-and-so, right? And mm -hmm. you can plug in these equations and go back and forth between all of these to kind of figure out where you fall, right? So if someone takes, for instance, they get a plot of an antenna, they get the visual of the antenna, but they want to know how much power is truly going out of the antenna. They could take that and they can put that into an equation and it says, okay, mm -hmm. you got 90% or 85% of the power going out, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, what I think is really interesting about the process of Ventive is you guys, just like uh, wireless engineers have to gather the requirements before you're starting a project, you guys go through a very, very similar process. You guys have to look at, you know, especially when designing a new antenna, you have to look at the purpose, you have to look at what they wanna use it for, you have to understand power levels. I mean, so you, are, you go through a very, very similar process to gather requirements. So let's look at how some of the specific, um, you know, folks have been talking about the inverse law and, and the power levels. Let's look at how you guys, bring that into the testing or into the antenna design part right. so, process. So I, I, I'm gonna have to give a plug right here. This is uh, uh, this is one of the charts. I kind of 
um, massaged it a little bit, but uh, <laughs> from uh, CWNA, right? Uh, CWNA study guide has, they talk about, you know, the power, mm -hmm. the power of tens and threes, right? Mm -hmm. So, and this is pretty much kind of, kind of talking about that with your gain and your power loss, right? So DBs, you know, is a relative measurement and it's a, it's a unit of power in RF, right? Mm -hmm. And then with power gain, um, anytime you have plus three DB of gain, that's two times the power, six DB, four times the power. 10 dB, 10 times the power, and so on, 20 dB, 100 times. And then with power loss, typically cables, connectors, uh, walls, any types of attenuation, you know, 3 dB of losses, you lose a half the power, um, 6 dB, three quarters, 10 dB, a tenth of the power, 20 dB, 100 of the power. So um, going to the right with the chart, as you can see, um, just with uh, DBMs to milliwatts, it's just the calculation and then also the formulas over there. Like I said, we basically start with the formulas, but right now you can go in into a calculator and plug this stuff in. Now, the reason why I have that 36 DBM up there is just to give everyone an idea. That's like the FCC maximum for um, mm -hmm. effective radiated power, right? ERP. So any, out, any design, like specifically for outdoors, that's like your max power level. So if you have a certain power level coming out the radio, based on what the maximum is, you know what the maximum antenna gain that you can have on that system. Yeah, and that's a, and that's a great chart. Um, I think it really uh, paints a good picture of, you know, um, how, intricate, how intricate we get. And we often forget what that, um, you know, Tawny, we often forget like what 3 dB loss is, right? We always talk about right. it in walls and mm -hmm. when we're planning, but it's like, okay, now we're putting the milliwatt behind it. Okay, how does that translate into my design and the impact? Right. How does that translate? Yes. Yeah. And, and that's where I have like a little plug. I always keep my chart ready to go, right? Is uh, <laughs> the, the, the Covenant um, book from Mr. <laughs> Mr. P. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's, it's, this chart is great. And, and I really thank you for sharing this one, Dennis, because it paints a good picture. And I think it's great for our audience to understand the gain and the power loss. Right. And then one more important thing on here is that you'll get the question from time to time of, I have a DVD and antennas that's a uh, spec spec in DVD, what is that in DBI, right? So mm -hmm. anytime you want DBI of an antenna that's spec in DVD, add 2.14 to it, and that'll give you the, the conversion to DBI from a DVD uh, rated antenna. Yes. All right, so let's look at, so now understanding all of the different parameters and the, the requirements that go into the antenna design, let's talk about how you actually bring them to life and do some of that testing. I know we've showed uh, you know, talked about the, the Stargate chamber before, um, but we're going to get to get a little more insight. Yeah, so, um, so this is, a, this is, this is a, what we call a Stargate chamber. And basically what it is, is it's, it's, a, it's a ring. Um, mm -hmm. This is the test chamber that we use. Uh, it's a ring with cross-polarized antennas. You can see the, the cross-polarized antennas um, up in that orange area, right? So, Basically with that, um, with this type of chamber, I can mm -hmm. test antennas probably, uh, it'll take me half the time to test an antenna in this chamber than in a regular, in, in a standard anechoic chamber. So that's one of the, one of the, um, one of the major uh, pluses about this chamber is that the, the time to test an antenna is uh, greatly reduced to, uh, compared to your standard uh, anechoic chamber, right? And then so mm -hmm. in that testing, some of the things that we can look at is we can look at the 2D pattern, we look at the 3D pattern, we, we get the gain of the antenna, we get the maximum gain or the peak gain of the antenna, right? So mm -hmm. I can get all of those uh, parameters from uh, all of my uh, measurements and then I can take those parameters and then I can put those in um, Echo House. So how do I do that? You know, mm -hmm. I take uh, what Echo House standard as far as how they want uh, gain numbers to be represented in their system. So I can generate files for them mm -hmm. and then they turn around and generate the VEX file so that that antenna is in their database. So when you go to do a predictive, you can pull up specific antennas um, to do your predictive survey. 
I'm still hung up on the Stargate chamber. Sorry. <laughs> That's probably the, I'm just waiting to. We lose to every time on that. <laughs> I'm waiting to encode that Chevron. Uh, is the DHD d- device somewhere? somewhere? Anyways, I know <laughs> that is a, uh, that is a, a, a great, um, you know, explanation of that. I, I, that the, the amount of effort that goes into testing antennas and understanding how they get in there. I mean, this is really is, um, uh, is a great review. And I know we talked a little bit, but this is, um, this really is as opens a door, opens a mind of how things are actually made, right? So now, uh, outside of uh, the chamber testing, we also do your stand. We do our visual testing. Um, we do our uh, return loss testing, right, to make sure that the antenna is resonant. Um, I, I, I saw one uh, something come up when in the comments about the visual one point five is like the the, per, the yeah. perfect is what to spec for. Um, and that, that is true. But when you get into broadbanding antennas, right, and, and trying to get antennas to resonate at different frequencies, so a multiband antenna, that visuar is going to um, is, is going to rise up. So that's why we set a two to one level, right? Um, a one a one one point five or one one point five to one visuar, that's a narrow beam width. And what we have, especially in the five gig band, we have that wide beam width where that's kind of not achievable. So we kind of expand that visual and, and knowing what the radios are and what the what they can handle as far as transmit it back into a two to one um, is acceptable. Mm-hmm. So Dennis, a lot of really good questions in the Q&A. One of the ones that I wanted to ask is what are the operating issues uh, on the different frequencies if the visual is null? If the visual is what is out of out of null, or if the, it is out of visual null, right? So that's all I said. That that reflective power, you have more mm-hmm. reflective power that could damage damage the radio if mm-hmm. it's outside of that visual range. Now that's more that's more on the transmit side. On the receive side, the receiver sensitivity is so good on these radios that that wouldn't be a, a major issue compared to on the transmit side. Awesome. So let's jump into specifically talking about external antennas and application, because I know there are a lot of uh, questions specifically related to that. So when should you be using external antennas in your design, Dennis? (laughs) So here we go. So um, external antennas, uh, what do we say? When ceiling heights are higher than 25 feet, um, when their propagation characteristics are affected by building materials or natural obstacles, uh, you have long corridors, you have like in the picture to the right, uh, high shelving racks um, where you're gonna get a lot of reflections. So you count, you want you want external antennas with narrower beam widths, mm-hmm. right? Um, high density networks, high density networks. You have a lot of people in the stadium. Everyone's trying to get on every try. Everyone's trying to tweet, get on Instagram, Facebook, uh, all of those types of things, right? Which are bandwidth intensive. So Mm -hmm. you want, you want uh, dedicated RF cells to certain areas within the stadium so that you can confine the usage in that area to an AP. So external antennas are great for that. And then, you know, my favorite is when aesthetics are important, right? So um, right now we're we're starting, well, for the past few years, we've seen a lot of the designs where um, companies don't want to see anything. They don't want to see the access point. They don't want to see the antenna. They want the antenna as small as possible. They want that footprint as small as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, aesthetics play a major point in that. And then improving network through, throughput through antenna reciprocity. We discussed that mm-hmm. a little earlier. Yeah, we're yeah. seeing definitely a lot of, of uh, architectural, you know, mm-hmm. um, changes, right? We're, uh, we're, we're being very sensitive to that environment now. It's, you know, the architects made it nice. The designers spent a lot of time and all of a sudden we add in <laughs> a big box, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're like, whoa, yeah. what's that, you know? Yeah. And, then, and, the good, and the good thing about that, Stu, is that you, you, you discuss the architects, right? So what that is doing is that's placing the Wi-Fi design and, and the antenna selection back earlier in the process, because now you have the architects starting to talk about 
uh, aesthetics and talking about how they mm -hmm. want certain things to look. So you're, you're mm -hmm. getting earlier in that process where you're actually, you know, we've, I've, I've been on calls where I've actually worked with architects for um, talking about Wi-Fi design and talking about antennas, whereas though in the past, it was usually the IT guys or, you know, all of, all of yep. the Wi-Fi guys, but now mm -hmm. you're actually a little earlier in the process. And when you get the architects on board, then it makes the budgeting process a lot easier because yeah. now it's, it's helping. And then, and I think, you know, and in, in, in my past life, you and I worked on a project that just did that, where we had to make sure that you getting an antenna that was so flush uh, that it, you couldn't see it or, or grab it or touch it for certain environments. And I think that was key is working early in the process mm -hmm. in selecting your antenna um, and not going to have to go back later on. If it's, it, I mean, if all possible, designing at that stage is much easier than retrofitting, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Especially, yeah. especially for old historic buildings and and those types of things. Yes, mm -hmm. I can only imagine where there's buildings where like you just can't make a change, right? Yes. You know, it's a 400, 400 year old building. Oh, I totally understand, right? We got to figure something out. Put it in a a light, <laughs> a ballard, right? That, that, we, that we're allowed and, to, and that, to put in, and that's what I specialize in. Yeah. So you know, it's <laughs> my happy place. <laughs> <laughs> we like Dennis to be in his happy place. Um, so, folks, let's look at some specific use cases. But before mm -hmm. we do that, I have another question for you guys. What are the most frequent issues when deploying a network with external antennas? Incorrect placement, cables connected incorrectly incorrect antenna orientation or just the wrong antenna was selected from the beginning. That's Stu, right. Yeah. Cue the music. I, it, it, it's cueing. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. <laughs> it's a little bit faster. <laughs> uh, so folks, please answer these questions. This is really good. Mm -hmm. Cause we want to see, you know, we have a full audience participation here. You say, if you can, I mean, there, there's some really key um, uh, things that we're, we're, we're looking at. Just try to see as, you know, as Tony said, all right, well, let's look. Uh, so quite quite a nice spread. Um, it seemed to incorrect antenna orientation uh, is seems to be the most common. Um, so so thank you folks for your feedback. Uh, so now let's look at, you know, Dennis was alluding to aesthetics and talking about some of the different things that you can do. It, it It's absolutely amazing when you go to places, when you go to theme parks and when you go to these historical buildings, you go to these architectural incredibly designed architectural buildings and you don't see an AP anywhere. You don't see an antenna anywhere. Well, where'd they go? Like, how did, how did you hide it? Where did it go? Right? So there's a lot of options, uh, when it comes to that, when it comes to aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, um, the aesthetics are playing a major role uh, with amusement parks, like uh, Tony was just saying, theming is really big, right? So mm -hmm. all of the different rides, all of the different worlds, Harry Potter world or, or Star Wars, you know, it's yes. all themed, right? So mm -hmm. the antennas have to blend in, right? So you can't have these big antennas out there and they don't blend in. So we come up with these aesthetic antennas that are paintable, that that can be blended into the theme. Um, and you don't even know that they're antennas because they fit perfectly with whatever's being done. And that's where aesthetics play a major role, right? So mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that picture to the left just shows what we call our candy, one of our candy bar antennas, right? Um, very small. Um, the AP is up above the ceiling, up, 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 up above the ceiling, and it's not mm -hmm. hanging on the grid. So, you know, that that's much more pleasing this way than to see that AP with an external antenna, right? Mm -hmm. um, that center one is uh, an open ceiling, but I need a directional antenna. So how do I mount it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and get coverage in those stands? So you have to come up with different ways to do everything. And then that one to the right is my favorite. That's... Uh, what we call our junction box antenna. We actually took a directional antenna and we embedded it into a three gang junction box. So, mm -hmm. you know, now you think it's a, you think it's a, uh, was a light switch that was covered up or something like that, but it's actually an antenna. And what's, what's interesting about that one. If you look closely, it articulates. Yes. It does. Yeah. Right. It that does. is a innovation, right? I mean, it's a, it's understanding like if we can get an antenna, but at the same time, we can also, and, and as we do in Ekehau, we can simulate the tilt 
right? Mm -hmm. and, and tilt is important. So if we're going to put it up high like yes. this one here, where we can now tilt and we can focus that energy in that area of, that we need it in. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's look at a specific one. Uh, a lot of folks, a couple of folks have uh, said uh, the warehouse antenna last webinar, we had a lot of questions. What would you recommend in a warehouse? Um, so, so let's look specifically at, at the Ventive warehouse antenna, uh, okay. Dennis. Yeah. So this is, this is our warehouse antenna, um, which by the way, was nominated as what, Tony? Uh, it was, it was nominated as, a, or it was a finalist for the Wi-Fi awards. <laughs> Sweet. That's yes, great. It was. Yes. We'll find the results out soon. So, yeah. So, so this, this, this antenna, um, this was a very extensive, intensive uh, design, right? And um, that picture actually just shows the radiators of mm -hmm. the antenna. It's a four port antenna. Now through the center, those are the 2.4 radiators, folded dipoles, as you can see. And then on the outside are the five gig radiators. And, and, and there was reasoning to uh, do it that way, uh, specifically because of pattern shaping, right? So mm -hmm. um, like I said, they were printed dipoles that we used for the design. Um, the height of the dipoles is much lower than the quarter wavelength to widen the horizontal beam, right? So this, this antenna has a horizontal beam width of 115 degrees. Um, so in order to do that, we had to get away from your standard quarter wavelength uh, and make it smaller, right? So that we can mm -hmm. narrow that beam, right? Um, the low and the high band arrays use separate reflectors so that you won't have any interspersing between the two or any interference on the patterns between the two. Um, like I said earlier, the five gig or the high band arrays are located toward the edge of the antenna. And then the reflectors are higher, the high band reflectors are higher than the low band reflectors to prevent shadowing, right? So, mm -hmm. so in order so that we don't, we don't get shattering, a shadowing on the antenna, that's how the layout of the, uh, the um, antenna was determined, right? So um, the adjacent arrays are offset in elevation from each other. And then we use CST Studio to optimize. I know that's a lot, but what basically what it's saying is that we took a lot of time to make sure that we got this antenna right as far as, um, as, far as the design, the mm -hmm. simulations, and the testing of this antenna. Well, and let's take a, a look at what that actually looks like. Okay, so right here, this shows the simulation of the numerical analysis simulation of the antenna. To the left, that just shows the pattern um, coming off the antenna to, uh, and with the radome on it as well. So one of the good things about the uh, about your numerical analysis, your CST, is you can model the radome as well, and you can change the height of the radome. So well, that's one of the things we had to fine tune was the height of the radome with respect to the antenna elements so that we wouldn't get any any mm -hmm. type of distortion between between the radome and mm -hmm. the uh, elements, right? So um, that radome ends up having a, a, curved, a curved structure to it so mm -hmm. that we have a have a uniformity as far as the spacing across those 2.4 elements, right? Mm -hmm. And this is specifically right, 2.4. Yeah. And then to the right, as you can see, uh, the pattern, right? So that's that's the pattern of the antenna at 2.45. Shows the gain, um, the, 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 the main lobe direction, mm -hmm. and then also the, the beam width of 100 and around 117 degrees. Side mm -hmm. lobe levels, the first side lobe is down almost 28 degrees. Now, the bottom one is the actual testing of the antenna, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at that, comparing it to the analysis or the numerical analysis mm -hmm. um, of it is very close. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's that's the one thing that we was trying to do, trying to get what we actually see in uh, testing it uh, to match what we uh, what we designed uh, numerically. And that's a really important point, uh, folks, because you want to make sure that what is in your predictive design is what's going to be measurable in the field and understanding that. Absolutely. And and let's look at now five gigahertz. Right. So with the five gig, um, the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, showing to the left just the, the, the 2D cut of the pattern and, and, and the colors just show 
uh, the amount of radiation, right? Uh, where the peak radiation is, the red area, which is out that towards the max of the antenna um, mm -hmm. to the right. Um, now, now the ripples is just at five gig. You tend to get more ripples at that frequency uh, mm -hmm. with the reflections of the radiator and the cable when measuring, right? So mm -hmm. um, then when we get into the chamber and measure, as you can see, you still get those exhibited ripples, but you're seeing uh, the, the bandwidth, the beam width being similar to what you're seeing, the, the, um, the radiation of the, uh, the pattern looking the same or close mm -hmm. to. So um, this is what we ended up coming out with and ended up releasing. And it took us a while to get this out, but I mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that we had something that operated with, with the same types of beam widths across the entire spectrum of the frequency of operation. So that whatever frequency that you was using this at, you, it, 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 it it exhibited the same or very close similar characteristics across that whole bandwidth of operation. Dennis, have you ever seen any issues with utilizing dual band antennas versus one that's like a single frequency? Have you ever run into that? Or is there a benefit to utilizing a dual band antenna? Well, utilizing a dual band antenna, uh, for one, uh, a lot of the a lot of the radios are dual band, right? right. So. Um, <clears throat> So you want you want a dual band antenna. Now the difference between the dual band and the say a multi band designed radio, um, the, for the most part is you can get like you can get closer, for instance, to that visoire one point five to one. So mm -hmm. you can definitely minimize the reflection of power back into the radio with a, a with a single band uh, mm -hmm. designed antenna relative to a dual band. Because with a dual band, what you do is you uh, you sacrifice some of that because you're trying to get this to get this structure to radiate at multiple frequencies. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got a lot of a lot more information, and there are a lot of really good questions. I want to make sure we get everything, but I know we've showed you the, guys this before. But for if those of you uh, who saw it last time, there's something new on here. Um, we're very excited. This little guy right here. Hey, there, what's he, that? He, what is it? What's that? I, I'm glad you <laughs> asked that, Stu. What is that? Let's it is Ventive's new Femto Patch antenna. And why that is really cool is it is quad band. Whoa, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. Did you just say quad? It is quad band. Whoa, I, it is I'm, quad band. Wait, quad, <laughs> hang on, stop. Nah, nah, let's see, we got, you got dual band, now we got quad band. What? Now we're talking like futuristic. Now we're into the... Um, the universe now <laughs> so dennis this is this is your two four five six and seven frequency or gigahertz frequency antenna that you yes. guys are working on right now that it's not right. out yet just to clarify it is not out yet sneak peek right here we're excited well, <laughs> if you can't tell <laughs> so yeah so this is our new femto patch so like i mentioned earlier uh ventive we're into small form factor mm -hmm. how can we make it smaller and and get the performance that we need and that previous chart just showed showed um this size how we've how we've gone from our original patch of nine by nine to now our femto patch which is 3.4 by 3.4 right mm -hmm. um so all of the things that we do, uh, the picture to the top actually shows what the antenna, um, <clears throat> what the antenna looks like. But I actually have one right here. I don't know if you guys can see this. Show and tell. Wow. Here we go. This Show and is, tell. This is a Femto patch with the see-through radome. So as you can see, you can actually see this is similar to what you're seeing on the screen, right? Um, can we get every this, antenna to have a see-through radio? <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, I've had that request, right? So um, someone that's on this on this uh, webinar right now is very happy that they're seeing this. <laughs> what a, wow, what it. a beauty. That's, uh, yeah. I mean, that is just, look at that. Yeah. That's, that looks right. like that packs a punch. Right. Mm -hmm. And then and the size of that. Edges, Oh, that's definitely, you know what? Thank you very much, Mr. Scott. That does look like a flux capacitor. You are exactly <laughs> right. Spot on. Yes. So that yeah, is. So, that's the new flux and, capacitor. Let's light that up. <laughs> and all of those, and, and, and it was designed that way specifically for manufacturability, mm -hmm. um, um, costs, uh, how the antennas mm -hmm. are, uh, how the antennas are, are mounted in there. So all of that was optimized to get this small package. Mm -hmm. 
And then what we have here is just numeric, just uh, the numerical analysis that was done on this, just to show the patterns of, of the antenna and um, the vertical and the horizontal planes at 2.4. So let's look at five, six, and seven. Okay. Because so, that's what, I, I mean, that, that's exciting, especially right. because six gigahertz uh, APs aren't quite out for public consumption. Right. So uh, they, these are your patterns at uh, <laughs> five, six, and seven, right? So as you can see, uh, the patterns to the left is the vertical beam width and the patterns to the right. We were able to get almost um, 120 degrees of pattern on the on the on the uh, on the beam width of the antenna in the horizontal plane, so we're talking a nice a nice coverage area mm -hmm. um, that would that would that would work well suited for this antenna even in this small package. That's very cool. And so, uh, one of the questions is understanding. So, Dennis, confirm. Yes. If you have a two, if you have a, a two, four, and five antenna gigahertz antenna you're not going to be able to it's not going to be able to read what's happening on six gigahertz it's not going to be able to help you in that regard so you're going to need a new antenna right you're going to you're right so we we talked about resonance earlier right, right. the resonance frequency right so mm -hmm. you're going to need the antenna to resonate at that frequency band right so mm -hmm. typically our antennas are designed to go up to that upper uh, around five nine and maybe some go up to six, but that's mm -hmm. just based on the beam within the performance of the right. antenna, but not specifically covered at six gigahertz band going up to 7.125. Mm -hmm. Awesome, that's very cool. Now let's look at the specific, the anechoic chamber testing from that, from the five, right. six and seven. Right, so these are patterns that was uh, uh, tested. Uh, these are, this, this is actual test data uh, from our anechoic chamber of the antenna. And if I was to be able to put these side by side, you would be able to see that these are pretty close to, uh, flip back to the previous one real quick, Tony. Sure. Pretty close to what you're seeing um, to the right. Um, mm -hmm. With uh, with the exception of you see more on um, below the antenna, uh, mm -hmm. you, you see more more pattern um, lobes and everything, and that's because of the cables when testing the antenna. But pretty much you're seeing you're seeing similar patterns that we're testing. So mm -hmm. the seven gig the seven gig that pattern that has a little more a uh, little little more ripple in it and um, non asymmetry but um, pretty good as far as getting for a first mm -hmm. pass of a design at seven gig. Mm -hmm. That's very That's absolutely cool. amazing. That's absolutely <laughs> amazing. Sorry, I was on mute there. I, 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 this, just the differences and I think, uh, Tawny, I mean, just look at the differences between the patterns. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's key. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, folks, you're seeing this first because you know, a lot of you probably actually seen what the six and the seven gigahertz patterns look like and, mm -hmm. and how to compare that between what we've been using for years and two, four and five. So it's, it's, it, it all comes back now, I think is to that design, right. Is, Hey, mm -hmm. designs are going to change yet again. Um, so. Yeah. What was the gain on this one, Dennis? Six. Six. six yes. Six dBi. Okay. Awesome. That's very cool. Well, you know, we're getting a lot of questions, a lot of really good questions specifically about the warehouse antenna. Well, let's look at that one in action. Let's look at that one deployed and what that looks like. <laughs> right. So, <clears throat> so what we have here is a predictive that was done using the 9130 AXEs. Mm -hmm. uh, the antenna was set at a height of 35 feet. We were looking at five gig only, right? Mm -hmm. um, the shelves are 20 feet high still. Uh, with 27 dBm loss. So what we were trying to uh, simulate is a warehouse facility that stores appliances. So appliances go on the shelves, right? So uh -huh. you have a highly reflective environment um, where you're going to need a uh, good penetration of your beam to get down to the floor. Mm -hmm. And so we used the, we simulated this using the warehouse antenna because the warehouse antenna has that, has that long um, horizontal pattern to cover the entire aisle, right? So with this design and this simulation, we were able, in, in Echohau, we were able to cover a 350 foot long aisle um, by 15 feet wide um, with exception of those two aisles that were 36 feet. But we were, 
mm -hmm. able to adequately cover that entire aisle with that antenna. That's pretty fantastic. If I if I do say so myself. It, yes, I'm, I'm <laughs> still mesmerized actually. Yeah. I, I want to go deep. I want to uh, yeah get into that project. Well, let's look that at even longer aisles. Yes. So with this one, so at that 325, we were kind of right on that 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 edge, right, as far as the coverage pattern of <clears throat> of that antenna. So this one with uh, 370 foot aisles, we were able to do, achieve coverage using two antennas mm -hmm. uh, instead of one. Um, pretty much the same characteristics as far as the height. Um, this is this is a five gig only design. Mm -hmm. um, the power level's the same. But just these were longer aisles. And in order to get that coverage, we ended up using two of the antennas per aisle to achieve getting coverage of 370 feet. Um, mm -hmm. With one antenna, it was, it was right on. It was very fringy on the edges. So just to make sure we had the, mm -hmm. the proper coverage along those edges, uh, the, 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 we ended up looking at doing two per aisle. Dennis, do you recall what the down tilt was on this one? There was no down tilt. These were directly overhead. So okay. these antennas are hanging directly overhead of the aisles. This is a very um, uh, interesting design. Uh, so it's... more of a more of a top down approach than say putting it on the wall and tilting the antenna, mm -hmm. which would be what I call a side to side approach. Yeah, and I think uh, folks will will. Yeah, I think it looks like um, maybe a couple of people put in the uh, the link to that specific antenna in the uh, in the in the Q and A possibly, but maybe we'll, we'll talk mm -hmm. about it at the end of the show. But that's an actually really interesting design, Dennis. Yeah. Um, where it's it's you're 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 kind of thinking out of the outside of the box here on this one. Uh, I, I I actually like it. Yeah. Well, and it's an it's an interesting conversation. You know, we're talking about what you can actually do with RF, what you can do with, with different things. You're not limited to top down. You can do anything with it. You can go from the ground up. You can go side to side. Uh, you know, there are a lot of options, especially when you're utilizing external antennas in your design, which it is an external antenna design is different than an internal integrated antenna design AP, right? It, yes. it, and it's supposed to be different. It's it's because there's different purposes, different needs. And, and so, yes, there are different um, design specifications and different parameters that go into an external antenna design versus an omni uh, or an, an internal antenna design. And cool. so understanding that, you know, with external antennas, you are not limited in, in what you can do. So, yeah, exactly. And then um, um, in our, our public venues, um, we're mm -hmm. talking about a side to side, that's um, antennas and handrails, where mm -hmm. you go side to side. So your coverage, you're covering, you're covering a section of the stadium mm -hmm. um, with one access point. I mean, two access points in an enclosure and two antennas, but you're mm -hmm. covering, say, the right side and the left side. So you're covering um, covering aisles that are uh, across from each other. And then that top down is just antennas overhead beaming down over the section. And then the bottom up approach is uh, an, a an AP and an access point. I mean, an access point in the antennas under the seat, underneath the seat. So that's what we mean by bottom up. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's very cool. Like, I don't know if you guys can, you can hook, hook them to handrails. You can hook them just about anywhere. It's just, it's there is like really a multitude of multitude of designs out there now is it, right. Is, and, and products to kind of figure out, you know, how does it best fit? Cause not all stadiums are the same. Right. I mean, I have those middle aisles, right? And if you're not sure what to do, if you're not sure which direction to go, pop them into the software and compare the patterns. Look at what's happening. Look at the different antennas. Um, look at, you know, I'm not sure if I want this antenna or this antenna, compare them and see what it looks like mm -hmm. in, in the software, because that's a great way for you to figure out what the best antenna will be for your specific design. Right. And, and, and yes. And, and this mm -hmm. slide just, just shows exactly that two antennas being compared to each other at mm -hmm. 2.4 and five. So you can see how the coverage looks, right? You can see, for instance, with the five gig, the antenna to the right has a little mm -hmm. more ripple than the five gig antenna that's beside it. And then also mm -hmm. has more of a back lobe, that front to back ratio, uh, right. where that comes into play is like, for instance, on that side to side design, you have coverage uh, of this antenna being shot into the uh, to the stands on the back side of the antenna. So, you know, when you want that 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 
that large front to back ratio so that you can directly beam that pattern and that coverage area to the stands. All of these play an important role into that. Mm -hmm. So Dennis, somebody was asking a question about um, the impact of antenna polarity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what is the impact of, of, of antenna polarity? Does circular polarity work? Circular polarity, yeah. So, so the, you, you <laughs> not have to your, put you we, on the spot already. We put them on the hot spot now. <laughs> so you have your polarizations, right? You have vertical, you have horizontal, you have circular, and then you have what's called slant forty-five plus or minus mm -hmm. forty-five degrees, right? So all of those different polarizations um, mm -hmm. uh, do different things, right? Typically, if you have a vertically polarized antenna at one end, you want a vertically polarized antenna at the other end. Mm -hmm. um, to receive the signal. If you have a vertical at one end and then a, then a, um, a perpendicular at the other end, you're not going to get any signals because they're crossed. Now, in, in, in Wi-Fi, an area that we play with, you get a lot of multi-path. So those polarizations aren't as important because you got the signal bouncing off of things. Mm -hmm. um, but this, it, we always design, for the most part, we are either design vertically polarized or we'll do a dual pole, meaning mm -hmm. it has vertical and horizontally polarized elements in the antenna. And that definitely, definitely helps in the multi-path environment. Awesome. Well, folks, we are close to the top of the hour here. Uh, wanted to put Dennis's information. If you have additional questions, Dennis is more than happy to answer any question that you have um, or, you know, just to understand kind of what Ventive does, please feel free to reach out to Dennis. Any final thoughts, Dennis, as we wrap up? Yeah, um, I, I need you to update my, my screen. I just got my at TGI Wi-Fi guy. I don't have my ECSE and I don't have my new, <gasps> my new oh, my bad. Whoa, I, excellent. I, I, job. I slapped my, I slapped, I'm sorry, Dennis, my bad. I, I apologize. I will get that fixed and corrected most most rapidly <laughs> Excellent. congrats Dennis that's fun. very cool fun. but yeah, yeah so yeah I went ahead and I took the CWNA <laughs> test so awesome that's very cool excellent um well well folks thank you for joining us today we'll we'll stay on for a little longer and and ask a, or answer a couple questions that we didn't quite get to um but dennis thank you so much for sharing with us really excited to see uh that warehouse antenna because that was something that wasn't working on when i was there uh and and so it's very cool to see that in action and, and see Absolutely. the completion of that uh folks yes to answer some of the questions uh ventive antennas are in ekahau pro so you can uh select that as part of your design in the ekahau pro software and with that thanks for joining <laughs>